The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You are going to hear a conversation. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 to 7. Rita speaking. What should I do for you? Oh, hi. I'd like to order some stationery. Could I know your name? Jackson Paris. Right. Can I just confirm your account number and the name of your company, Jackson? Sure. The number is 692411. Six nine two four double one. Right. And you're from Rainbow Computer? No, the company is Rainbow Communications. Oh, OK. I'll just fix that on the system. Communications. And what would you like to order, Jackson? Envelopes. We need a box of A4, that is, normal size envelopes. White, yellow or manila? We'll have the plain white, please but the ones with the little windows. OK, one box. A4, white. Just one box, was it? Um, on second thoughts, make those two boxes. We go through heaps of envelopes. As a matter of interest, are they made from recycled paper? No, you can't get white recycled paper. The recycled ones are grey, and they're more expensive, actually. Right, we'll stick to white, then. Something else, Jackson? Yes, we need some coloured photocopy paper. What colours do you have? We've got purple, light blue, blue, light green, whatever you want, pretty much. There are 500 sheets on the pack. Let me see. We're going to need a lot of blue paper for our new price lists. So can you give us 10 packs, please? Make sure it's the light blue, though. 10 packs of the light blue. Anything else that we can help you with? Let me think. What else do we need? I'm sure there was something else. Ends, paper clips, fax paper, computer supplies, office furniture. Oh, yes. We need floppy disks. Do you have those nice coloured ones? Yes, but they're a bit more expensive than the black ones. That's all right. I'm not paying anyway. Right. Floppy disks. What about diaries next year? We've got them in stock already, and it's a good idea to order early. No, I think we're all right for diaries, but something we do need is one of those big wall calendars. You know, one that shows the whole year at a glance. Do you stock those? We certainly do. OK, can you include a wall calendar then, with the other stuff? Just make sure it's got the whole year on the one side. Sure. Now you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen to the next part of the conversation and answer questions 8 to 10. And do you have a copy of our new catalogue? No, I don't. But would you send one? Yes, I'll pop one in with the order. You'll find it a lot easier to remember what you need if you have our catalogue in front of you next time. Yes, good idea. And when can you deliver this? Should be with you tomorrow morning. Can you make sure that it's not after 11.30am? Because we have to go out at 12. There's only myself here on Fridays. Fine. I'll make a note in the delivery docket that they should deliver before half past 11. Thanks very much. Thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an extract from a talk about the Scottish Highlands. First, you have 30 seconds to look at questions 11 to 18. Today I have with me Moira McKenzie, the author of several books in a well-known series of travel guides, and she'll be talking about what is probably the most fascinating wildlife area in Europe, the Scottish Highlands. Moira. Yes, that's right, and it's a wonderful place to visit with lots to do in an area that makes up over half of Scotland. Including the 790 islands that lie scattered around the coast, it covers 39,000 square kilometres. Getting there is easy. From here in Glasgow, a good starting point is Fort William on the west coast, with regular bus and rail services linking the two. I'd recommend the train, which takes four hours to get there. Alternatively, you can take the Highland Line, which takes the more easterly route up to Inverness. That, in fact, is a bit quicker, taking around three and a half hours to cover the 280 kilometres from here. There are also two main options by road. You can take either the A9 up through Stirling and Perth and then on to Inverness, or else on the west there's the A82, which runs up to Fort William and then, if you want, on to Inverness. Now, a lot of people associate the Highlands with bitterly cold weather, but in fact the region has a generally mild climate as a result of being surrounded on three sides by sea, particularly the warm waters of the Atlantic. At sea level in the west, for instance, the temperature ranges on average from a minimum of 1 degree centigrade in January up to 18 in July, and you can actually see palm trees growing there. Obviously, though, the temperatures will be lower inland and on higher ground. You can expect it to rain a lot too, particularly in the west, where annually as much as 2,000 millimetres regularly falls, though this helps account for the rich variety of vegetation and wildlife. When you get there, you'll find there are plenty of reasonably priced places to stay, in Fort William, for instance, you can find a room for the night in a small hotel or a bed and breakfast for just £25, or for £28 to £30 in Inverness. It's probably a good idea to book ahead, though, especially in the summer months. With all the leisure, sports and cultural activities on offer, the towns are becoming increasingly popular with visitors. For example, accommodation in Inverness won't be at all easy to find this year around the 23rd of July, as that's when the local Highland Games will take place. So, if your aim is to see the countryside, it may be best to stay in a small village. Now you have some time to look at questions 19 and 20. As I mentioned, there's a huge range of wildlife in the Highlands, but for those visiting the area, there are some basic ground rules that are essential if we are to protect it. Firstly, you should make every effort not to disturb birds and animals, and one way of doing this is to blend in with your surroundings, for instance by avoiding brightly coloured garments, such as orange anoraks. To see wildlife clearly, it's best to use binoculars, keeping your distance. This is particularly important during the breeding season. Wherever possible, 
Use a hide so that they are less likely to detect your presence. Surprising though it may seem, visitors are advised to use their cars where no purpose-built hides are available, as people are apparently less likely to startle animals if they stay inside their vehicles. You may even find that creatures come up close to where you're parked, in which case, wait until they've gone before you move off. It should really go without saying that it's essential to be as quiet as possible, though sadly, some people need reminding of this. Oh, and one other thing. Wild animals and pets don't mix, so please leave your dog at home or at least somewhere he or she can't chase the wildlife or damage their habitat. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a discussion among three students who are organizing an international film festival at their college. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully to the first part of the discussion and answer questions 21 to 24. Thanks for coming to this meeting on such short notice, Anna and Veronica. It looks like we have just become the organising committee for this year's International Film Festival. We've all just met, so perhaps we should start by an introduction with a bit of background from each of us. OK, I'm Anna. I finished three years of a languages degree in Sweden, where I come from. This year I decided to study overseas to get to know a different part of the world. I'm also a big fan of European cinema, especially French and Italian. Those are the languages I majored in, along with English. To me, film is a great way to learn about the rest of the world. I was in the film club at my university, so when I saw the notice asking for volunteers, I thought it would be a good way to meet people and get involved in something I really enjoy. Thanks, Anna. My name is Veronica and I come from Italy. I'm doing graduate studies in English literature. I went to some of the films in the festival last year and enjoyed them. I especially liked the video interviews. That was when I decided to get involved. I used to do film reviews for our student newspaper back home. Hi, I'm Chris from Scotland and I'm in fourth year journalism. Cinema is my hobby. Last year I joined the organising committee just like you have now and somehow this year I've ended up in charge. I'm actually able to use my coordinating work on the festival towards a credit for one of my courses. I have to write up a report on the festival with recommendations, so that's an extra motivation for me. So I hope this is going to be a good experience for us all. OK, where would you like to start? How about a general overview of the festival? I don't really know much about it. Well, the film festival was started by International Student Society five years ago and has grown every year. It is held over four nights during study break. Wednesday to Saturday. Normally we show three films a night. Last year we tried to choose films from different parts of the world that fit together in some way, maybe a similar theme. Or we could feature a type of film like action films or science fiction.
Now you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 25 to 30. Who picks the films? It's up to us on the committee to decide. You mean we get to pick all the films ourselves? What a hard decision. There are so many to choose from. Well, that's the fun part. We have this catalogue of independent distributors. The films are listed by language and have a short summary. We just have to go through it to find a good combination of films that will attract an audience. Veronica mentioned something about interviews. How does that fit in? We set up cameras in the foyer of the theatre and did live interviews before, during intermission and after the screening. Anyone from the audience could come up and talk about the film. The Broadcasting and Journalism School set it up and ran the interviews. They were shown on big screens around the lobby and in the theatre. It went over really well. We had a long lineup of students waiting to be interviewed on TV. Everybody wanted their minute of fame. Great idea. Yeah, it worked really well. We should certainly do something similar again. Maybe even develop the idea further, like a website with audience reviews and discussion, so we can get as much participation and involvement as possible. Hey, that's a good idea. Can I ask a question? None of the films are in English, right? Are they dubbed or subtitled? Well, we do occasionally choose a film in English, but only from unusual places where the dialect is so strong they sometimes need subtitles, like the Caribbean or even Scotland. The majority of films in the festival are foreign language, dubbed in English. We've learned from experience that students don't like reading subtitles. Maybe they read too much already. Whatever the reason, the subtitled films get smaller audiences, so we avoid them as much as possible. So how large an audience can we expect and how much does it cost to get in? It costs $5 per film or a $20 pass for the whole event. All 12 films for the real movie fan. We would have broken even last year, except for a bad storm on the Friday night. We almost had to cancel the whole thing. But overall, we had a good turnout. More than 2,000 people in four days. Oh, that's what I was wondering about. The financial part. Where does the funding come from? What kind of budget do we have? The festival is subsidised by the Student Council. We generate money through advertising and through admission charges. We'll go over the budget in details a little later, but we've got lots of work to do in the meantime. I guess we have to start pretty soon. Well, I think by the 1st of March at the latest. We need to select all the films. Then we have to find some advertisers to sponsor the event. That shouldn't be too hard. We'll just start with last year's list. Our deadline for that should be the middle of March. By the end of March, we need to design the program. Then we can get posters made up and distributed in April. Like you said, we need some clever promotion, something to generate interest and get people talking. We have four months to get ready. It should be enough time. OK, where do we start? Let's start by talking about films, since that is the best part, and see what we come up with. What was the best film you saw last year? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. Four. You will hear part of a lecture about public speaking. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. It is only natural to feel somewhat nervous before giving a speech, and while a few nerves never did any harm, and can in fact prove beneficial, letting your nerves overcome you can be detrimental. Today's presentation will focus on ways to control those butterflies, and help you to give better presentations in future. First and foremost. You've got to know your material. I can't stress that enough. If you fail to prepare, you might as well prepare to fail. Even the most experienced speakers never turn up unprepared and never try to wing it. Personalize your subject and use humor, anecdotes, and conversational language. This will make it easier for you to remember what you want to say. Secondly, practice, practice, practice. Rehearse well in advance, and preferably out loud, and with all the equipment you plan on using. Practice your timing, when to pause and when to breathe, and prepare for the unexpected. Something always goes wrong, especially when you're relying on technology. So always have a backup plan. Get to know your audience before you have to stand up in front of them. Meet and greet them on the way in, perhaps. It is much easier to talk to a group of friends than a group of strangers, and just as importantly, know your room as well. Arrive early, pace the speaking area, and practice using the microphone and visual aids. The hardest part is trying to relax. Never rush straight into your speech. Begin slowly and address the audience first. In fact, even before you start, take a few deep breaths. You know. One one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand. This will turn your nervous energy into enthusiasm. Visualization can be a great confidence booster. Visualize yourself making the speech in the way that you intend. Imagine your voice loud and confident, and picture the audience clapping and rooting for you. Remember, people want you to succeed. The audience wants to hear an interesting and insightful speech. They aren't hoping you make a fool of yourself. Whatever you do, avoid making unnecessary apologies. If you make a mistake or two, forget about it. Few will notice, and it will all be forgotten before too long. People often forget the importance of body language. Don't underestimate this. Your words carry far less meaning than your delivery. Success is defined by your intonation and confidence. If you come across as a confident person, people will listen to you. You will command their attention. Stand tall and proud, and deliver with conviction. Humans are very bad listeners. We remember less than twenty-five percent of what is said, and place far more emphasis on how it is said. Last of all, be realistic and give yourself a chance. No one becomes the perfect speaker overnight. It takes time to hone your presentation skills. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.